was something that I identified that I had uh, the capabilities to teach a class, first of all, and um, I had the interest to help out these kids. And there was also a need that existed there uh, that I could fulfill. So that was something that I guess demonstrated leadership on my part. Um, I also have examples from my own experience of like joining clubs and getting leadership that way. Um, so yeah, there's just a whole bunch of ways that you can demonstrate leadership to colleges. Um, so yeah, you just have to explore. Uh, my son's interested in playing computer game, so we plan to start a playing games club, yeah. and then just get the kids playing games with him at okay. school. Um, so yeah, that does demonstrate leadership. Uh, however, um, it's like the kind of message that you send uh, might be a little bit different. So um, if, you're, if you're starting like a hobby type of club, specifically about video games, um, the, so there's, 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 there's two different types of things, right? You have leadership on one side, but you also have like, what's the impact of your leadership, right? And so something that is aimed at um, creating uh, like a video games club may not have the same impact as uh, leading like a volunteer organization or something like that. Which I think you probably already know. <laughs> so. Um, so I guess like since we're still waiting, could I maybe see what ages like everyone is or who their kids, how old their kids are, so maybe I can make my talk more relevant to them. Yeah. Uh, ninth grade. Ninth grade, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean next year or the past year? Uh, next year. Ten. Ten, okay. Just eight. Eight, okay. Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Nine. Nine. Eighth grade. <laughs> okay, um, so most of you are not in high school yet, or I, I guess not most of you, but well, hopefully this is beneficial. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk like about most of what I did in high school, and so it's a good thing that most of you aren't like juniors and seniors, so it'll probably help you out. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll just wait until we start. Does anyone have any other questions? What activities did you do in high Yeah, so that's going to be a really big chunk of my presentation. So um, I, I don't really want to spoil it now, I guess. Yeah. So uh, in what age do you really find your passion and want to spend a lot of time on it? Oh, yeah. 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 Supposedly in elementary school, right? Uh, well, not always, and I'll, I'll talk about that. So, yeah, <laughs> let's leave that for later. I, I, I'm going to go over that. Yeah, yeah like, um, we heard that the college one you to spend your extra curriculum and your summer program focus on something like what you want to do in the future. But my sons don't know what they want to do in the future, so they cannot focus. It's just a, a wide spread, mm -hmm. which is not good, but we don't know what to do. Um, well, I think like... But how parents can help kids yeah. find the passion? <laughs> yeah. Um, so something that I think my parents kind of helped me out with was, um, well, I, I don't know. I was kind of, it, my passion was kind of obvious. Um, I didn't know what it was, but like other people could see. So when I was little, like, um, I guess I'll talk about this later. But um, when I was little, it was, it was like people could clearly see just by how I acted and, or what I would do um, versus what other kids would do. Um, they could see that I was very interested in science from a young age. And that wasn't something that I was consciously thinking about, uh, but it was something that like my teachers and my parents noticed about me. And so because of that, they were able to guide me. Um, so in the case of uh, if, you, if you don't have such a clearly uh, visible uh, passion, um, I think it's a good idea to just try a bunch of different things. Um, try to get involved and get your feet wet 
um, and just see like if, if there's something that you actually enjoy doing, uh, maybe start pursuing that. Um, it's it's honestly it's never too late to start. I know someone uh, who start. I think she gave a talk uh, here before Angela Kong. Um, she actually didn't start research until uh, her junior year, and she found that she really enjoyed that. Um, and she was an Intel STS finalist, and she's going to Stanford next year. So it's honestly never too late to start. Um, you just have to figure out and try new things. Yeah. I hope that slightly answered your question. Yeah, I think um, you can start. I can start? Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so thank you everyone for coming on Sunday evening. I hope you find this somewhat valuable. Um, because I know it's going to take two hours of your time. So uh, I'm ma mainly going to be talking about um, my high school experience, I guess, like what I did in high school, how I approached classes, how I managed my time, uh, and I'll talk more about that. So here we go. Um, I don't know how many of you um, like read my uh, the advertisement, which talked about kind of what I did, what some of my accomplishments were. But if you didn't know, uh, I am really interested in science, and uh, it's quite apparent from, I guess, my achievements and the different activities I was involved with. Um, so I kind of already talked about this, but I was interested in science from an early age, and I've, I had a very clear passion. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about, I guess, my different passions, because I'm not only passionate about science. Um, and the second bullet point, I'm a recent graduate of Limbrook High School. Uh, I graduated like two weeks ago or something like that. Um, and again, most of my high school time was spent doing science activities. Um, and the last bullet point, which I don't know, probably brought a significant number of you here, is that I'll be attending Yale University this fall. Um, I'm currently undeclared, but I'm interested in a wide range of things, mostly in science, but not limited to that. Um, so on the right, you're probably wondering who this old guy is that I'm standing next to. Uh, and he's actually the 2013 Nobel Prize winner for, in physiology and medicine. And so I was able to meet him by, uh, I was invited to a, uh, a weekend visit. It was all expenses paid to Yale uh, in February um, because I was a likely admit, which is um, basically they, they admit you early, earlier on uh, to give you more time to think about going there. And so this is one of the cool things that I got to do. Uh, while I was there was I got to talk to this Nobel Prize laureate. Um, and it was really cool because I could actually connect with him about some of my research experience. So does anyone have any questions about me? Uh, you're probably not very interested about that, but any questions? And if, if you have questions at any point uh, during this two hour talk, um, feel free to just like stop me, I guess. Um, I, I won't get mad. And there, I'm going. I left a pretty big chunk of time uh, at the end of the presentation for you just to add, ask questions. So I, I definitely encourage that. So here's just an overview of my talk. It's split up into four parts. The first part um, is going to talk about a lot about specifically a high school in terms of academics, testing, and stuff like that. Um, and so a big part of that is about balancing. <coughs> A school with extracurriculars, you know, like if you're involved with a sport, a club, uh, maybe doing some music on the side, how are you going to manage all of that? Um, and the second part, which I think is very important, is going outside your comfort zone, you know, trying new things. Um, and more importantly, like taking things to higher levels, which I guess haven't been done before. Um, hopefully that doesn't sound too weird. But the second part is I'm going to talk about more about my activities. Um, my activities were more in science, but hopefully, if, even if you're not in science, this will be somewhat helpful to you. Uh, I'm going to talk about, obviously, the importance of finding a passion early. I know a lot of you are concerned about that. Um, and the, the second part is research opportunities. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you are interested in hearing about that. Um, and I guess I have more experience than most uh, about uh, finding a research opportunity, which I know it's it's kind of difficult for people who don't have experience doing something like this to actually get into. So I'm going to spend, I guess, a spe uh, specific slot of time talking about that, and I'm hoping that you have questions about that. 
The third part is the college app process. I'm going to kind of outline what I did. Um, and I'm also going to analyze some of my admissions results um, in relation to maybe what I wrote and what I did. Um, and so you'll see that later. And finally, the last part is the importance of family support. Um, I can honestly say that um, my family played a humongous role uh, in, in where I got to today. And so hopefully I can share some of the things that my family did for me um, that helped me and maybe it can help you as well. Okay, so I'm going to start off the first portion, which is covering my high school experience. And this is just an outline of what I'm doing. I'm not really talk about this. So jumping into classes and grades, um, this is something if you if you haven't had experience, or if you if you haven't had like an older sibling or something, or if you haven't talked to people, uh, deciding on classes uh, can be really challenging. Um, and so it's very crucial to make the right choices because these are going to define uh, your years of high school. So I split this slide up into like three categories that I think are really important. Now the first one is course load. And so this is just identifying like how many classes are you going to take? Um, and how do you plan to balance this with what, whatever uh, else it is that you're doing? And so I wrote here that it requires an idea of what extracurricular activities that you're going to do. And so this is something that you need to put quite a bit of thought into. If you're not exactly sure what exactly you want to be doing, um, maybe think about how many things you want to be doing. Uh, and think about that first, so that can help you decide on your course load. Um, and so an important thing to note here is that uh, you, you don't want to take too many classes but you also don't want to take too little, right? Uh, if you take too many, you're going to overwhelm yourself. And that's honestly, that's probably the biggest stress that you're going to have in high school is just um, getting bogged down in too much work and too many responsibilities and not having time to sleep. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to take too little because if you have too little classes, you're not challenging yourself and colleges can really see that. So the second point is rigor. Um, Hopefully this is like an obvious thing, right? You want to be taking challenging courses. These are the AP courses. These are the honors courses. Um, and this kind of ties in closely with course load uh, because again, you, you don't want to be taking too much stuff. You want to have too much stuff in your hands because um, bad things can happen. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about like how I went about taking my classes in just a second. And of course, the last part is GPA. This is a pretty important number. Um, it's, it's, it's crucial for college admissions, I'm sure you all know. Um, and it's, I wrote here that's important to show improvement or maintain your GPA. Um, and the reason I say this is because uh, multiple college admissions officers who I've talked to uh, have specifically talked about uh, showing improvement throughout high school or maintaining excellence in high school. So if you're starting out as a 4.0 student, uh, you don't want to drop down to like a 3.0 or a 3.5 or a 3.7 or something like that. Um, that being said, when you start out high school, if you don't start out as like an all A student, um, it, it, colleges will understand that you're still transitioning. Um, and so over the course of your next three years, um, maybe you want to show some improvement. That, that really shows that you're maturing and you're growing. Um, so that's important as well. So. Uh, that's me. Um, this is a snapshot of my uh, transcript. Uh, this is taken from, I believe, after my first semester of senior year. Um, and so you can see here, um, this, is, this would be my ninth grade course load. So you can see that I was taking seven classes. Um, I was taking you know, the basic literature and writing, biology and PE. Those are all required. Uh, you don't really have a choice about those. And then I was also taking Algebra 2 Trig, which is uh, you're required to take a math course, but um, Algebra 2 Trig is like one of the more advanced ones. Uh, you can also take Geometry or something like that. Um, and Chinese 3 is just to fulfill a language requirement, and Java was because I wanted to see what CS was all about, and Band was for the uh, art requirement. So you can see that I was challenging myself, you know, I wasn't taking like the lowest level classes and I was also taking the maximum amount of classes uh, that you're allowed to take. 
And you can see like my grades were all fine. Now, in 10th grade, um, you can see that I have these H's next to these three classes. That means it's an honors course. So it's like an accelerated high school course. Um, and so when you, when you factor it into your uh, weighted GPA, it'll count as a five instead of a four uh, if you get an A. So you can see that I took three honors courses. Um, this is, I don't like, yeah. So this is more than the usual amount. Um, usually people have two. Uh, but I had the addition of Chinese, <laughs> so uh, I was taking like what's considered to be a more advanced uh, and more heavy course load in sophomore year. And, and again, I took seven classes, so uh, I was still challenging myself. Um, and so in junior year, uh, I took six classes this time. Yeah? How can you, all your weights are five? They are all five? Yeah, no, no, no. So this weight is um, for the California like graduation requirement. So you need oh, to reach like 220 that's or something like that. Yeah, um, this is not like the actual weight. Okay. Like I'm, I'm really not sure why they put five. Okay, yeah. so she mentioned your grade. Yeah, well, our weighted is 4.0, how about weighted? Um, I haven't like calculated it, but I would guess like maybe. Oh, your school does not calculate it? Yeah, because otherwise it would show up on the transcript. So the way you would calculate it is just like, these are all fours, so four times seven, four times seven, um, or actually three times five. And then you would just add them up and average them. I think it'd probably be around 4.6 or 4.5. Um, and if you don't count freshman year, it would be even higher. Um, because I know most UCs don't count freshman year, so. Um, so yeah. all, all, the, all the other classes are five? Yeah, all honors classes and AP classes are five. So come to how many APs? Um, so in my junior year, I took four AP classes. Um, and let's see, that shows my senior year uh, course load. There's three for first semester. Uh, I didn't get my second semester transcript yet, but I took four uh, AP classes in second semester. Um, and so you're looking at a total of eight AP courses, uh, but I also took like AP tests outside of that. And I will definitely go over that uh, later on. So we're still talking about junior year, I believe. Um, and so I'm taking four AP courses in junior year, um, pretty much in all places that I can except for history. Uh, and I'll talk about, I, I guess, why I didn't choose to take history. Um, maybe now, I guess, would be a good time. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about it more later. But um, specifically, like, I. This is one of the cases where I didn't want to get overloaded. Um, and this is an advantage of when you have like friends that are upperclassmen, you can ask them like, okay, how much work is this class gonna be? What's your experience like in this class? And specifically, this class, AP US History, um, some of you may have already heard that it's notorious for being very difficult um, very time consuming. And so since I'm not like planning to be a history major uh, or anything related to the humanities really, um, I decided it wasn't worth it for me to take um, because it really wouldn't demonstrate anything other than uh, I spend a lot of time studying and I can get good grades. And so that's not exactly the, I guess, the image that colleges are most excited about looking at. And so that's that's the choice that I made. Uh, and so you can see senior year, three APs in first semester, four APs in second semester. Um, and I did get one B uh, in my high school career. That was in second semester of senior year. Um, that's when like college, colleges don't look at that semester, so I got one B. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I guess I, I did a pretty good job. Um, and I don't know if you guys still want to take pictures, should I leave it up? Any questions right now? Okay. Uh, we can come back if you, if you still want to take pictures. <laughs> I don't know if my state ID is like an important thing, but you know, <laughs> don't do anything. Um, okay. So, uh, so, got a question. Yeah, sure. You, for example, you get a, an AP <coughs> class, you get an A, I suppose. Yeah. 5.0. Yeah. But would, uh, for different schools, you know, here in San Jose, Cupertino, Milpitas, are they about the same difficulties? If yeah. you talk about the same, same name, I mean, AP, say, yeah, yeah, that's a really great question, actually. So, 
me just go back to that. <laughs> um, so the the reason why I guess my school doesn't print the weighted GPA is because uh, in reality it, it it really isn't that big of a of an indication of the rigor of the classes that you're taking, and they mostly look at the cumulative unweighted GPA, and that's the one you're reporting to colleges. And so uh, when the colleges look at, for example, people from Milpitas or Lindbergh or Monte Vista, um, they're looking at the unweighted GPA. And so they're saying like, okay, you got this grade, right? Um, and even then after that, as like a sort of metric uh, to compare uh, different schools, you're going to be taking the AP test, which is standardized across the nation. And so your score on that is kind of how they used to um, see like what type of excellence you're achieving in a certain subject, um, and not so much like your specific grade in the class. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Question regarding you taking Java in the Netherlands school. Yeah. Is that hard to get it or? I just signed up for it and they gave it to me. Um, so in How my ninth in that class? yeah. So when I took it, it was actually mostly ninth graders. Um, I think the, I think it's slightly different now. Uh, I think more and more and more people are realizing like, okay, I need to take this class, right? Um, and so I think uh, because I, I waited until senior year to take AP Computer Science, and so I noticed in senior year um, my class was actually more seniors, and so what that means is maybe people are taking job in junior year. Or sophomore year, and so it, it might be harder. I, I honestly don't really know. So, yeah. any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> so, testing—that's another big portion of high school life. I don't know. Some of you may have already taken some of these tests, actually. Um, so, the biggest one you're probably worried about is the general SAT uh, or or the ACT. And so these are like the, I don't know, the hallmark of your, of your testing experience. Um, and it's, it's a, what a lot of people use to like see how smart people are, which I think is it's really not a good thing to do. Um, but I, I hope that you all know like what these tests are, because I'm not really going to talk a lot about what they are. But I'm going to tell you now that these tests can be taken as early as freshman year. And there's a very big advantage for taking them as early as possible, um, simply because the preparation process uh, can be extremely time consuming. And um, you're only going to get busier as you go through high school. So getting it done, uh, say, in freshman year, uh, will save you a ton of time. And a very important thing to note is that as you go through high school, and as you take like literature and, and writing in ninth grade, these classes aren't going to help you score better um, on this test. Because you already know the material. It's just you need to learn how to take this test. Um, because the these tests, like that's the reason why you need to take so many prep classes is because the tests are designed so that um, it's not so much that they want to see how much you know, but more like how well can they trick you. So, yeah, I, I would say that it's very, very beneficial to take the prep course early um, and get it done. Uh, but at the same time, make sure you're getting a score that you're proud of. Um, and I know several kids who uh, took it in freshman year and scored both 2,300. So. <clears throat> I, I actually didn't do that. I took it in junior year, but I'll talk about that later. So the second point is many colleges super score. Um, and what this means is that if you score low in, say, math one time, and in the next test, when you retake it, you score well in math, but you score terribly in, in like writing or something. Um, they'll take your highest math score and their, your highest writing score and combine them. Well, most colleges do. Um, most privates, most, pretty much all schools except for public schools. Um, and the last point is that the SAT one is changing to become more like the ACT. And so you may have heard that the ACT is more tailored towards um, like math and science people. Uh, maybe you've heard that it's harder, but it's less tricky. And whether or not this is true, uh, it is true that the SAT1 is changing to become more like the SAT, uh, the ACT. And this is happening in, I believe, 2017. So uh, many of you are in eighth grade or so. 2016. Oh, 2016. March 2016. <laughs> March 2016. Um, 
So yeah, uh, many of you, it may be relevant, uh, depending on when you decide to take this test. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. So I'll talk about like how my SAT testing went in just a second, but I want to go over like the different tests. So the SAT 2, these are the subject tests. Um, most colleges require you, they want two scores from you. So I would say take at least two. Uh, and take more if, if you want. But again, the same thing applies. It's very good to get them done early. For example, math level two can be taken after 10th grade uh, if you took pre-calculus honors because everything on the math level two test is covered by pre-calculus. So as long as you did well in that class, you should be able to take it. Um, and taking a prep course is going to be valuable. Uh, I did take a prep course. Um, the second part is chemistry. Basically the same thing applies. You can take it after taking chem honors. And the last point is that biology. There are two biology tests. Uh, it's like environmental and molecular. You can take them after ninth grade, although um, you definitely should do some self-studying. <coughs> I have a question. Yeah, sure. So you mentioned is AP chem or AP bio help test or is better after AP class? Um, yeah. So personally, I like know I know people who took it um, after taking AP Chem, and I feel like they would have done better if they just took it after Honors Chem because AP Chem you're not learning so much the fundamentals, uh, which is uh, what the, the this this Chem Honors class or or the Chem SAT class is gonna is gonna uh, test you on. Uh, but at the same time, you still need to be taking like prep courses because there are topics that uh, no class in, that you're going to find in school is going to teach you, um, and those are like the more trivia questions or like not covered by the standardized test type of questions. Um, about your relevant test, uh, three science um, AP test. Yeah. Um, is it the more the better? Because which one is yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, like I said, take at least two. Um, and I would say taking like a billion is not going to show that you're any like smarter. It just shows that you study more. So um, that kind of brings me to my next point, which is uh, it should reflect your areas of interest uh, or your strengths, right? So if you're really good at something, you should take it because um, it's probably going to be easier for you to score higher. Um, and more importantly, if it's in your area of interest, uh, you want to show that you're already somewhat proficient uh, in this subject, um, and so, so you should take it. But there's no reason to be taking like, there's no reason for me to be taking like uh, history or something if I'm going to be a science major, and I didn't. So, yeah, like I, I really don't see the value of like overloading yourself with a bunch of tests um, if it's not going to show uh, that you are. Uh, like, it's not going to make you any more qualified to be doing what you're doing or what you want to do. Um, at the same time, it just takes a bunch of time. So, uh, yeah. But, but at Yale, you are still undeclared. Yeah, so... Therefore, it is not necessary that you go to science. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, it, of course, like, I am undeclared um, in on paper, but in my mind, I know that I have no interest in studying the classics, or studying history, or studying music. And so I already have identified that I'm going somewhere in the sciences, but I haven't decided, OK, I'm like doing <coughs> theoretical physics or something. So if you pick uh, chemistry and biology, if you mainly go to like, life science, uh, like if you go to double E, computer science, besides maths, what else do you pick? Yeah, so I think if you're going into like engineering, there's really, uh, you, there's no like engineering test, right? Um, so you're, you're definitely, you probably you want to take math level two. Um, and you'd probably take uh, physics as well, and maybe chemistry. Those are like the closest to testing your uh, cognitive abilities that may uh, play a role if you're pursuing engineering because they're all like similar thought processes and uh, critical thinking abilities. Uh, are there any, yeah? yeah? Just a question. For the ICT, you said uh, they can uh, choose the whatever the subject that you take is the highest scores. Yeah. Is that, is that true? Um, oh, for example, you take it two times, and then the first time your math is kind of higher, the, the second time math is lower, and then you know, opposite way for the English, you know, 
anxiety yeah. or comprehension. Yeah, that is that is definitely true. That's what's called super scoring. Mm -hmm. And so I'll show you like my scores. I took it twice, and I'll show you uh, the individual scores and the super score. And that that is how most colleges look at it. So how do you know? Is the college board going to transfer the higher scores to the school, or is that the you know, transfer will never take? They should be sending uh, all your scores, okay. and then the college will see like okay. I'm just going to take your highest scores from each subject. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, did you have another question? Oh, yeah. I said it's up to the college. Some college takes super score, some college don't. Yeah, yeah. So most private schools do, and uh, like the UCs don't, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and there may be some others, but I don't really know. So, yeah. I'm going to continue. Oh, okay. Uh, one question is uh, uh, what's the relationship between? AP. Yeah, so I'm about to talk about AP testing. Uh, is that okay if I just go on? Yeah, so... Oh, actually, no, I'm talking about PSAP first. Uh, I'll just talk about AP test first. I'll talk about AP test first. So, AP testing, right, um, this, it's very similar to subject tests because they're, they're narrowed down to, like, specific subjects, right? Um, but instead of testing you on, like, the fundamentals, maybe stuff you would learn in high school, um, AP tests are more, they're considered more advanced. Um, and so they're supposed to test you on maybe freshman college level uh, stuff. And so that's, that's I guess, the difference. Uh, the testing format is also very different. Um, and so that's kind of like the differences between AP tests and SAT 2s. Um, and so my advice for AP tests is to take AP tests for all of the courses that you take. So if you're taking calculus, BC, and like, physics, mech, C, um, definitely take those AB courses because if you don't, um, it kind of looks bad because it seems like maybe you didn't learn anything in that course. And again, as I talked about earlier, um, your AP score is going to be a good metric for how colleges are actually going to look at how, how well you've learned this subject instead of like just your grade. Um, and I, uh, the second bullet point, I kind of like, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to say, but um, personally, I think that taking extra AP tests uh, can be impressive, but the same uh, token applies here as to SAT twos. In that, um, if you're if you're like if you're like me and you're you're going into like the sciences, most likely there's no reason for you to be taking AP Human Geography, right? Um, and so, of course, if you have like an interest in that or a natural knack for that, go ahead and take it. But I just don't think that um, colleges see something like that and are impressed by it. Um, so yeah, it's honestly up to you. I personally think that um, taking extra ones can be good, but it's not always necessary. Uh, and I'll talk about what I did later. Yeah. Uh, if a student uh, takes SAT in uh, freshman or sophomore yeah. and get a good grade, and does he still need to take PSAT? Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just about to get to the PSAT part. Um, PSAT is, is, is an optional test. Um, the only reason you uh, people take it is so that they have a chance to get what's called a National Merit Scholarship. So that's like something that you can put on your college apps, uh, and it's supposed to look good. Um, but it, it's definitely not required. Um, and even getting the award is, is really not necessary uh, from personal experience. <coughs> So the PSAT is a test that you take in uh, sophomore or junior year. Um, however, your score only counts towards the National Merit Scholarship uh, in your junior year. So the reason why people would take it in their sophomore year is just for like practice or for experience. Um, and it's structured pretty much exactly like the SAT uh, one. So if you've taken some prep for that, um, it's, it's giving you double rewards. Um, and so in California, Sadly, um, the national merit score is based by state, so our cutoff is particularly high. Um, and generally, you're going to need to score around 20, 222 out of 240. Um, in my year, I got a 222, um, and the cutoff was 223. So, <laughs> so it was quite unfortunate, but uh, as you can see, like I personally don't think it did very much. Like. It wasn't a detriment to my college applications. 
So now I'm going to give you the tell all. Oh, yeah, sure. Just, uh, for the, for the National Merit Scholarship, that's the relative to the state? It's relative to the state. So this is this is my scores. Uh, not quite sure why you're taking pictures of these, <laughs> but um, these are just my scores. So as you can see, like this shameful number, uh, 740 for math. Um, I can honestly say, like, I have no idea how that happened, but it happened. So uh, I was I was I needed to take it again, and so you can see here. Uh, the first time I did poorly on math, but I did well on writing. And the oh, second you, time around. You got that, you got that math wrong? October, October is right. after January. Uh, no, 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 oh, January of junior year, so it would be the next year. Oh. Right? Because your school year starts next year. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, hopefully, I wouldn't make a mistake like that. Um, so, you can see here, like, this kind of talks about the super scoring thing again, right? I did poorly on math the first time, did well on writing. Now the second time, tables have turned, right? I, I did well on math, did poorly on writing. Um, and so you can see like the super score that most colleges are going to be looking at is 800 math, 800 writing. So you're ending up with a 2320, which is decent, right? Um, yeah. And so what, yeah. What's your essay score? Uh, ten or eleven? I don't. I don't really know. Um, it's an eight hundred rating, so I don't really care. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I honestly just don't remember. Um, so, and something that I kind of want to add is, um, if you're applying to like UCs, right? They don't super score, so they're looking at your highest overall score, and that would be uh, my January one, which was like twenty two seventy. 2270, um, and so that's like, it's, it's good, I guess. Um, and you'll see that I still got in, so um, I guess it, it doesn't matter. Like, the 2300 barrier, I suppose, is not as important as some may make it out to be. So for SAT 2s, um, I did the right thing, and I got them done early. Um, and that saved me a lot of trouble because uh, when I was like a junior or senior, I was looking at my friends and they were suffering because they were taking the SAT 1 and the SAT 2 and they did, they were like trying to prepare for both and it was very difficult. So I did the right thing here, I got it done early. Um, and I took these all just once. Um, and you might be wondering like, how did I take physics? Yeah. Um, that's because, I don't know, I just, I just know it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of, I kind of dedicated like some time to learn it. Um, because I was interested in it, and so I, mean, I never actually took a physics class in my life. Oh, wow. Um, so, wow. yeah. So you learned by yourself? Yeah. How can you learn physics by yourself? Um, I, I feel like if you have a strong math background and a good textbook, it just takes a, few, a bit of time. How much time? Um, <laughs> like a summer, took me like a summer maybe. A whole summer? Um, to learn up to the level of like, Physics Olympiads and my finalists. So. Oh, you did that. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, it's it can be time consuming, but it's definitely possible. Um, does anyone have any questions specifically about this? Yeah. The book. So yeah. when you study physics, which book you? Um, I can recommend a few good books, but the one that I used was called University Physics uh, by Young and Friedman. Um. And so you might want to buy volume one if you're looking to study for uh, physics Olympiad semifinals. Um, and if you want to go further than that, you would want to buy the other volumes. But uh, uh, University Physics by Young and Friedman. Uh, yeah. So what kind of prep did you do for your SAT one? You took some classes? Have yeah. You yeah, I did take a prep class. Cool. Um, I'm not sure if I'm at liberty to say, oh, okay. um, <laughs> just given the, the venue, um, but yeah, I did take one uh, relatively close by. Uh, yeah. Yes. Very hard. Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with that book. Uh, the other college uses textbook, but some that still use this textbook. It's a very good book. Student. 
from the sound system and the other. And you self taught yourself. Ah, uh, yeah. It's very hard. Exactly. Yeah, harder than EP. So that's a college freshman. This college, yeah, MIT uses this. And the sound system state, yeah, all use this textbook. So, yes, that is a very good book. And how long did you prepare for your essay? Oh, yeah. So, physics, I did not take a prep class, I kind of just took it. Um, math level two was after pre-calculus, so I took a one month like prep course where they basically just gave you a bunch of practice tests and then so I just took it after that. Um, chemistry, I had, I took it after uh, chemistry honors and I also took a two month prep class uh, for that, so. Yeah. Uh, SAT one was, I took a prep class uh, the summer before my junior year, so that was like a month and a half Do you recommend the, the prep class? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, because there's like these certain like nuances about the test that you're not going to learn unless you take a lot of practice tests. Um, but that can take a lot of time. So getting a prep class, you're going to learn these things a lot faster. Um, and these are things that you're you're not really going to pick up anywhere else uh, unless you're taking a lot of these tests. How many classes? Uh, so I took one class for SAT 1, and one class for math, and one class for math. Uh, and of course, like, the SAT 1 prep was accompanied by the thick official college board book. I'm sure many of you have seen it. It's like 10 practice tests. So yeah, that was also part of the preparation. Uh, yeah. Under, like, uh, like a report, you never get credit on your physics, right? Yeah. Somehow you manage to, like, uh, that's sort of exceptional, right? Um, uh, like, what's the information you're trying to send? To yeah, so, um, that was, uh, you could probably say, like, that was what's considered impressive, right? Like, learning something on your own. Um, and I'm, it's not like I'm the only one who's done it. There are, I know, like, at least three or four other kids uh, who have done that as well. So. Uh, and those are just, like some of my best friends. So, yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, it's just most people don't realize uh, that they can do it, or most people don't have the interest to do it. So yeah, it's it's definitely achievable. Uh, sorry, her hand was up first. Yeah. Um, do you mind if we talk about your parents' contribution to your um, uh, science background? Does your parent teach you at home, or or do you at your time you don't like your parents to teach you? <laughs> yeah, so my dad was a material science guy, I guess. He has a PhD in material science from MIT. Um, but he he doesn't have like the time, I guess, to teach me. But I guess maybe when I was young, I, some of the science like passion was instilled or some of the things that he showed me uh, just started my interest, but uh, by no means was he like drilling me on like physics or something like that. Uh, and my mom, uh, she's more like business and stuff, so she doesn't really teach me like this stuff either. So, so who answered the question? This is a question. Lan Bao Shu, huh? Yeah. yeah. An another book I spent a lot of time with. Yeah. Do you have questions for me? Um, so, generally you would ask like a teacher at school, um, or like my dad could answer them. So maybe if he has some time, I could just ask him. Um, sorry, you had a yeah. question? I have a question about your preparation for math. Do yeah. you do some extra out of the school, like under, for another math book? Um, so yeah, I, I took a prep course, right? So, um, at the prep course they would give you like materials that you could study. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and continue on, because, uh, yeah, uh, I'm really not very far through my presentation as I should be. Um, <laughs> so PSAT, right, uh, sophomore year, I, uh, I honestly don't know what I got in sophomore year, but it was, it was like 210 maybe. Um, and in junior year, 222, uh, quite a sad day for me. Um, <laughs> but it, it, honestly, I, I, I don't think it played that big of a role for me. Um, but again, it is a, an accomplishment that I missed out on, um, and so yeah.
Now for AP testing, I only have my junior year score so far, um, and so you can see all of those. I only took eight, uh, AP courses for these four, um, and I decided to take the physics AP courses um, just because I wanted to. Um, and so you can see those scores are, are good. Um, and so I can talk about what I took in senior year as well. Yeah. Um, so if any of you are like interested in going down like the physics Olympiad route, I would say that physics C mechanics. Uh, oh, thank you so much. Um, I would say that physics C mechanics um, is far below that level. So if you're planning on learning mechanics very well, uh, the AP test should be no problem for you. Again. So which level is higher than which level? Yeah, so the AP physics mechanics, um, what they test is um, much less uh, rigorous than the physics Olympiad. So if you're planning on preparing for the physics Olympiad, um, the AP test should be no problem. The physics Olympiad had two levels, one is yeah. semi-final, one is final. Yeah, so which if level are you talking about? Uh, the initial level because it's only mechanics. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try to go on because I am quite behind. Um, so yeah, extracurricular activities. Um, this is something we talked about uh, quite a bit, is just like identifying passions and talents early. Uh, and an important thing to do is to try different things, right? Um, this is something I touched upon earlier, but there's no way that you're going to find out that you like something unless you try it. And so, and honestly, it's not too late to start. Um, so yeah, that's something I encourage. And so the next part is that focus interests are, I would say, um, many factors of times better than spread out interests. Um, because if you are dabbling yourself in like dance and in violin and in science and in basketball, and you're not achieving like something high in any of those, but you're participating in all of them, um, I think it doesn't show as much as saying that you have a focused interest in maybe computer science, and you've coded a few apps, and you've done use of code. Um, so yeah, I, I think that focused interests are much better than spread out interests. And it's definitely a good place uh, for you to show your eventual path um, as you go on to college. Um, and it may help you, yeah. Um, do colleges pay more attention to how you um, that's a good question. So, I feel like some colleges will, um, but a lot of colleges won't. So, and I don't want you to take this as like the truth, because I, I really don't know. But I would say that um, many private institutions uh, may may look at uh, unique, more unique um, activities uh, with in a better light than say like UC Berkeley or something like that. Um, so yeah, and the second point under that is make sure to cover your bases. And what this means is that instead of like extremely spread out interests where you're doing everything but you're not good at anything, um, you want to cover your bases so that you have no particular like weakness. The college doesn't say like, okay, this guy like doesn't do a sport so he never goes outside or something like that. Um, because in the end, colleges are looking at who you are as a person, not so much, oh, how well can this guy study? Um, because really, they're looking at your personality and how good of a student and how you contribute to their community. Um, so it's important to cover your bases, make sure that you are going outside every once in a while um, so that you, you, you at least appear uh, a wholesome person, uh, which you hopefully are. How many volunteer hours? Um, so, personally, I did not keep track. And contrary to popular belief, there's no real place for you to put in how many hours. Um, and also, contrary to popular belief, um, no one is going to really care that much. Um, <laughs> because um, anything you report is self-reported. Um, and so there's, it's very hard to show legitimacy. Um, Unless maybe you have like a letter of recommendation from like your advisor or something like that. How about math? Yeah. Are are the tests are the tests for 
AMC, Amy, those those kind of camps, you know, not academic. Yeah. So are they important? Um, yeah. So if you're shooting for something like MIT, um, MIT is particularly concerned about how well you do on this test um, because they actually are one of the only colleges that have a specific slot on their college application for your AMC scores. Um, so me in particular, I did do well on the AMC. Uh, I was like on the honor roll or whatever, and I still didn't get an MIT. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you, you, you probably have to do pretty well on that test. Um, so yeah, uh, they, they are important. Um, and they are going to be good for getting into more of the technical schools, I guess. You honor roll for AMC? Uh, AMC uh, 12, 12A, yeah. I have no idea. Um, I just know that I got to the Amy and didn't do well on the Amy. Um, but yeah, it was like top, I don't know, 5 or 2.5%, something like that. So yeah. Uh, math is not like my strength, but I suppose I'm above average. Um, so the last point would be find a balance. I kind of touched upon this when I was talking about courses, but it's definitely important for you to not bog yourself down with work. Um, you have to go outside once in a while. You have to hang out with friends once in a while. You have to stay like a person. You don't want to become like a study robot. Um, because really in the end, that's not going to do you any good. Um, but at the same time, keep yourself busy, you know. Don't spend all your time playing games. Don't spend all your time hanging out and watching movies because that also probably isn't the best thing. So yeah, keep yourself busy. Find a balance. So, I'm going to talk about my extracurriculars. Um, I'm only going to really talk about my main ones. Um, if you want to know about like how I covered my bases, so to say, um, I can talk about that as well. So, a big thing that I was involved in was Science Club. Um, and some of like these bullet points may seem weird, like why I put them on there. Uh, but I feel like they are very important. So the first one is that I have a four-year involvement in high school. And so people might say, like, oh, great, you went to meetings for four years. Uh, what does that mean? But I think it really shows that I had a clear interest, because I already knew that I was interested in science. Um, so I joined as soon as it started in my freshman year, and I was involved um, until the last meeting. And so I think that really shows that to both to colleges and to, I guess, other people, um, that I was set on this path already. I already knew what I wanted to do, and so that's kind of why I put that up there. Um, so the second part is that I ran for office every year. Um, <laughs> and that may seem kind of uh, dinky to put up there as well, but I think it's also a very important point because it means that I was actively taking a role. I was always involved in this club, and I was always seeking to go higher. Um, so I think that's also a very important point. Um, and so you can see that my second time running, I was, eventually, I got something, right? I was the treasurer in my junior year, and in my senior year, I was the president. And so, this was a very significant involvement because uh, not only was I managing a club of about 150 or so members, um, but I was also um, reaching out into different activities, organizing inter-club activities, inter-school activities, um, organizing some of the other activities that I'll talk about later. Um, so yeah, it was a big responsibility, but it was very rewarding at the same time. Um, second point would be Science Bowl. Um, you can see that I actually put five years up there because I got started um, in eighth grade. And I actually wanted to get started in seventh grade, uh, but the team had already been made when I found out that this competition existed. Um, but if you don't know what Science Bowl is, it's essentially like a Jeopardy style game specifically about sciences. Um, and it's it's a pretty big competition run by the Department of Energy. Um, and so as you can see, it's very important to start early. Uh, the earliest time you can really start is sixth grade. Um, and I start in eighth grade, which is actually earlier than most people. So you can see that it did pay off because um, <clears throat> I was on the team in high school pretty much every year. Uh, so I was always competing. Um, and I was on the varsity team for two years. And to give you an idea of like how um, hard it is to make it on these teams, um, particularly for Limbrook, uh, we have 
what I consider to be a stronger team. And so we have about 100 or, or more uh, people try out for the team every year, and we have 10 slots um, for two teams and five slots on the top team. So it is very hard to get in. And so you can see that in my senior year, I was captain of the varsity team, uh, meaning that, um, well, obviously meaning that I did well on the tryout process, but at the same time, I was managing uh, practicing practices, organizing scrimmages, uh, making sure people were on task, making sure people were improving, uh, teaching younger students. And so, yeah, that was a very big part of my high school life. And a little advertisement, um, I'll be teaching a science school class uh, here starting next week. So if any of you are interested, maybe talk to someone. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, wow, it's not going. Okay. Um, so your school team always can place uh, some. Yeah. So this last year, um, we got third place. Uh, not as good as I had hoped, but uh, no laughing feet, I guess. Um, we third did. Place we did well. In the nation. Uh, third place regionally. Oh. So this would be uh, the Bay Area, and I don't want to sound like. Like I make an excuse, but our regional is one of the harder ones. Um, so yeah. Uh, now I'm gonna start talking about Miller Science Fair, and honestly, you guys have probably never heard of this. And this is something that I touched upon earlier, which is basically the program that I started at the local middle school, uh, actually my old middle school, um, where I began mentoring students. And so the reason that I give this this activity its own slide is because I believe that it is particularly important in my college admissions decisions, and I'll talk about that in a second. But um, it's essentially a mentorship program that I started in the beginning of my junior year and continued my involvement with it through my senior year. Um, and I've actually passed it on, so it's not like the program's dying on me uh, after I leave. It's actually going to continue and grow. Um, but it's, I guess you probably already know it's for mentoring. Um, and I've helped over 60 middle school students get through the process of doing a science fair project and they've continued and become more independent. Some of them have even won awards. So the reasoning that I have for why I guess it was one of the most critical, I wrote the most critical factor, but not really. I feel like it's one of the most critical factors uh, in my admissions decisions. I had the unique opportunity to talk to my Yale admissions officer um, and this was at the Yes Weekend, uh, I actually have, I got my bag uh, from that, but it's like, um, it's the invited, like, weekend for, like, specifically for, uh, engineering and science and math kids, uh, they invite like a hundred students, um, to go, and so I actually got to talk to admit my admissions officer, and she specifically said that, um, my involvement with Miller Science Fair, my involvement with the science uh, outreach program uh, specifically showed that I had a deep passion for science and that I had the willingness to spread it to other people. And so this made me stand out. And um, I guess that's why I believe that it was very critical because not only did uh, my admissions officer specifically uh, bring this up in a conversation with me, but she also remembered that it was like that it would actually match up with me. And so I think that was really um, important considering she reads probably thousands of applications. Um, so yeah, continuing on. I talked about covering my bases. So these are not necessarily things that I am like as passionate about as science, but they these are definitely things that keep me grounded and I do enjoy doing them. So the first would be Octagon volunteering. This is the particular volunteer organization that I joined uh, as soon as I got into high school. And eventually I worked my way up to become an officer in my senior year. Uh, I suppose that's important. Now, trumpet, I've been playing for seven years, and it's important that I was consistently in the top ensembles because um, it shows that I'm not like playing it and being bad. I'm playing it and like playing it well, I guess. Um, so that's also important. Now the last one is Taekwondo. I practiced for 10 years. Um, I did actually stop uh, my involvement in it 
in around 10th grade because I simply had too much things to do. Um, but I did go like quite infrequently. Um, so you can see reduced commitment in high school, um, but it wasn't like I was holding myself up indoors all day. I was still going outside. It just wasn't like, um, because I used to go like three or four times a week, and that was too much of a commitment for me to keep. So it was lower on my priority list. <clears throat> so now talking about time management, I'm sure a lot of you are curious about this particular topic. Um, I had a clear order of priorities, and I kind of touched upon that about five seconds ago. Um, so Taekwondo was a bit lower on my priority list than um, maintaining my involvement in volunteering and in science. So uh, the second point is that I minimized the time spent on schoolwork. Um, some of you may be reeling back um, at, this, at this supposition, but um, this is not to say that you should disregard your classes um, as, as like nothing, uh, because they are definitely great opportunities to learn. Uh, however, I believe that if I could minimize time spent on schoolwork, I could spend it at other places where I believe that I could learn more. Um, <clears throat> and so I learned to work quite efficiently. Uh, and this is a skill that uh, is very crucial for uh, depending on how much you want to take on in high school, right? Um, and so you have to learn very, to work very efficiently. And so on average, I, I wrote that I spent three to five hours on schoolwork per day. Uh, obviously, this varies, varied throughout my high school life. Um, in like, okay, so many of you may, may have heard the, the, I don't want to say rumor, but the idea that the junior year is going to be the hardest year of high school. Um, in my personal experience, that is completely false um, because I believe that the sophomore, my sophomore year was the hardest year. And I think um, while the idea may be true, I, I learned uh, how to work efficiently. Um, I, that, I really learned how uh, when I became a junior uh, and when I started taking more classes. And so I actually spent less time on school work in junior. So the last point I think is really important and kind of undervalued is the importance of making use of class time. And so instead of maybe uh, spending, so my particular high school has these 35 minute um, sort of, they call themselves tutorial uh, periods where they happen on Mondays and Thursdays and they're just set up for you so that you can talk with your teachers uh, and get help on anything you, that you have problems with. And so, as I walk through school, generally I see people using this as like extended brunch or break time. Um, and I think that that may be a contributing factor to why uh, they stay up late and um, do not work so efficiently. And so making effective use of something like that, or even just like a break in class, um, or just even dedicated work time in class, which some people may squander, um, is, is very important for maintaining like your time management. And so the last point, which I believe many parents um, may be concerned with, is giving up, say, like video games. Um, I know I, I talked with a few parents yesterday. I was at a, a panel discussion. Um, but um, it was a parent brought up the idea of, like, did you play video games? Um, and I told him that I did indeed play video games. Um, however, it was um, sort of my own discipline that I kept it in moderation. And so I think that's also an important thing to note is that um, you definitely need to, you can um, indulge at certain points. Uh, and it's definitely good to indulge at certain points, but you can't let it take control of your life. Um, so this last point is like super sad, um, but I rarely hung out with friends and that's one of my biggest regrets um, in high school, especially since I'm leaving to college. Um, but I guess it's something that you have to give up. Um, so yeah. How how you relax yourself after you study really hard for two hours or something? Um, to be honest, like I I I don't I don't really get burned out that easily. Um, but I I didn't play like a whole lot of games, and I didn't really watch TV either. So my main relaxation was just going to sleep. <laughs> to be honest, yeah. If you don't watch TV, how can you know the news? Um, so, most of my news comes from online. Um, 
some of you may have read it. Um, I do enjoy that website. Um, and there's also like news.google.com. I, I visit that quite frequently as well. Um, there's there's just a ton of online news resources that that many of my <laughs> my peers use. Yeah. You don't go to school dance. Um. <laughs> so <laughs> throughout my entire high school uh, life, I went to two school dances out of maybe thirty. I don't know. There's a lot of like there's there's a lot of like smaller dances. Um. So yeah, I went to a really small one in my sophomore year, and I didn't like it very much. Um, <laughs> it wasn't for me. And then I did go to senior prom, uh, which I think everyone should go to, because it only comes once. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. So some results of effective time management. Obviously, I earned good grades, um, and it's it may seem kind of counterintuitive that I'm spending less time working on homework and I'm still earning good grades, but um, I think that I actually got more out of the less time that I spent um, because I learned, I was more focused during the time that I spent studying, and so the retention um, was better, and so I was able to earn good grades. Um, the second point is that I was obviously able to dedicate more time to doing other things. I've listed some of them here. Something at the bottom, um, I kind of want to brag a little bit, um, but um, I needed to spend a lot of time writing a research paper because I wanted to get published. Um, and I actually, uh, my paper was accepted recently uh, to a scientific journal, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and I guess the last point that um, parents can physics? Um, yeah, so it's kind of like interdisciplinary. It's, it's, um, it's about molecular conductance and um, a more efficient method of measuring it. So it's, it's kind of related to both, I would say. Um, it's kind of engineering as well. <coughs> Where do you do this experiment? Yeah, so this will be covered quite in depth <laughs> later. Okay. Um, I only have an hour left, and I'm like not even like a third of the way through. So I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. Um, and I'll definitely address that later. So. Yeah, a last point, parents might like seeing this, but I got a lot of sleep. Um, and so I was able to keep myself well rested, which a lot of people uh, are not able to. So the next part is taking advantage of summer. And so this is something that's somewhat underplayed, I would say, um, because I know a lot of people who, like my peers, who did not take uh, effective use of summer. So. The first point, many colleges want to know what you did over the summer. They'll have specific sections on their applications asking you, how did you spend your summer? And what were you doing? So I think it's particularly important to do, to, to, to do this. And I'll talk about what I did um, in, a, in a later section. So I would say some of the more positive things uh, that you could do over the summer um, are working. Um, this could be. Uh, just a just a job. Um, it doesn't have to be something exceptional. Um, but if you want to demonstrate a certain interest or passion, um, having an internship or a lab position uh, can be can show uh, colleges quite a bit about yourself. Um, that being said, if you have like uh, just a job, uh, it does demonstrate responsibility. So and independence. So that those are also important things uh, that colleges are looking for is just to see are you mature enough. And so holding a job is, is a good way to show. <clears throat> the second part is a summer program. Um, most summer programs nowadays that have like prestige are application based. And so if you make it into one of those, um, it can demonstrate a certain level of achievement um, that people can plainly see. And obviously going through a summer program, you, you reap a lot of benefits. Um, and it also at the same time might give you something to write about um, in your college application. And the last part is volunteering. I know a lot of people go on like mission trips and stuff. Uh, I personally don't have experience with that. But I think summer is a good time. Since you have a lot of time, spend a little time helping other people is good. So yeah, that's just something. Um, and some, some of the worser things that you could do over summer 
studying, I put this here, it's a very good thing to do. Don't get me wrong, it's a very good thing to do, but do not write about it, please. Um, if, if, you, if you write on your applications, I spend my summer studying, no one's gonna want you. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, please do something else, I would say. And um, obviously doing nothing is bad as well. Yeah. That concludes my first part one of four, um, and we're at the one hour and five minute mark, so does anyone have any questions or I'm just gonna jump in? Okay, so this is the outline, blah, blah, blah. Um, a lot of people were asking about like how did I ident identify my passion, right? So science was kind of, I kind of touched upon this. Um, it was more of other people noticed it about me, um, and then they kind of guided me towards that. And I kind of wrote some stuff, some examples of what my parents have told me. And so some advantages of this is that it made me very, it, it made it a lot easier for me to pick like what I wanted to do, right? So I did science fair ever since kindergarten. Um, I was I was recently moving uh, into a new house. I moved in yesterday, um, and while I was moving, I found my kindergarten science fair board. Um, so that brought me back uh, quite a bit. That was interesting. And uh, science school since middle school. Uh, my passion for science led me there as well because I'd accumulated uh, quite a wealth of knowledge by that point, and I knew that I could do well in something like this. And I also found that it was very fun. So yeah. And in high school, obviously, I touched upon this. Uh, I started science club as soon as I got to high school, and I was involved in it throughout. So uh, there are very big advantages to knowing what you want to do and starting early. <coughs> now, um, I also re more recently um, discovered that I have what I'm, I might call a passion uh, for teaching. And it's definitely not as strong um, as my passion for science, but I find that teaching gives a sort of instant gratification um, that it's difficult to find it anywhere else. Um, and so it was more recently discovered through volunteering. So I volunteered at an organization called Sunday Friends, and um, I taught uh, like young Mexican children like English and stuff. I played games with them, and I thought it was really fun. And so I started looking for new ways that I could do this, and this included peer tutoring at school, um, specifically in math, chemistry, and physics, um, and doing Miller Science Fair, which I talked about in quite a bit of detail earlier. Um, so yeah, um, again, identifying this passion and exploring new avenues through which I could um, more completely uh, fulfill it, um, it, it, it reaped a lot of benefits for me. And um, final point, which I think is extremely important, is that it led me to writing better college essays. Because in the end, when you're writing college essays, you're gonna write them about experiences. And so going out and experiencing things is always a good thing. <clears throat> so the next part is about finding opportunities. Um, this is probably what a lot of you are concerned about. I would hope. Um, and it's what a lot of high school students that I've talked to um, have been concerned about, specifically underclassmen who have asked me for advice. And so I think that it's there are a lot of opportunities out there, it's just people aren't really aware of them. Um, and specifically at school, there are a ton of opportunities available to you. Um, as long as you have some sort of interest, it doesn't need to be explored, it doesn't even need to be that big, you just need to have an interest. <coughs> Uh, you can join any club, pretty much, um, and you can join it and start getting involved in their activities, start learning more, and maybe develop a passion that way. And at the same time, maybe, I don't know, get an officer position or do something significant in that club that you can write about in your college apps. Um, and so it's important to take advantage of, of the people who are around you. And so asking up a classroom about what they've been doing um, asking like relatives who have um, who have kids who have gone to college already, uh, that can be really helpful. Um, the next part is about academic opportunities. Um, this is not to dissuade you from trying to pursue these, uh, but generally they are more difficult to get involved in because uh, people who have started earlier um, already have experience, already have accumulated knowledge uh, that they can use to push you out of these because 
these are generally centered around like teams um, or individual performance, um, but there are generally barriers to entry, uh, higher barriers to entry for academic opportunities than other ones. And so uh, some examples are Science Bowl and Science Olympiad. Now there are certain exceptions that I want you all to be aware of. Um, so there's Science Fair, you don't need to like know very much uh, science per se to do Science Fair, um, but to do it well, I suppose you would need to know something. Um, and speech and debate, um, pretty much no one really knows how to do the specific types of debates um, that people do in speech and debate, but um, so that's why you start uh, at pretty much nothing um, when you join as a ninth grader. And so these have lower barriers to entry, but by no means are they easier uh, to ch achieve success in than other activities. <clears throat> so something that I have I guess um, more experience in than other people is finding opportunities for research. And this is something that has more recently uh, been of interest to people. And so I have a few um, avenues of, of trying to find an opportunity for research that I've uh, laid out here. So the first one is looking for summer programs. Um, this is maybe the most structured uh, way um, and some may consider it the easiest way to get a uh, research position or research opportunity. Because um, nowadays, many programs are based around um, getting a student and bringing him through the process of conducting research and doing it in a formal lab and having a structured project and structured guidance. Um, now the issue with this is that um, pretty much all of these without exception is application based. So you're looking at um, SSTP, SSP, RSI, Simmer, and I can talk about these more later. Um, but these are generally quite difficult to get in. Um, I believe RSI has someone, something like a 2% acceptance rate or something like that. Um, so they're more, they're harder, harder to get into than say like Stanford or something like that. Um, but yeah, they can be difficult to get in, but uh, if you do get in, um, it is very good. Um, extremely good because you will get uh, a lot of attention um, from these professors that you won't find um, in these other two options that I'll talk about. <clears throat> so um, the second option is to individually seek out professors. And this is kind of similar to the second part which I'll get to, but this is like trying to contact professors that you've had no previous interaction with uh, in your life and asking them like, hey, uh, I've read about your research, I think it's really interesting, and I'd like to come talk about it. Um, and I think that many people pursue this route and uh, it's not successful at first, and they're dissuaded, and um, hopefully that doesn't happen to you guys. But it's honestly, it's extremely difficult to even get a reply back that says no um, from these professors, but um, there are, I know of people who have um, gotten this to succeed, so it's definitely possible. Um, now the last one, which is tied into the second point, is to take advantage of connections. Um, and I have listed some connections that you may have here. Um, in my particular uh, experience, my father worked with a professor at Stanford, I think maybe like 20 years ago. And he, was, he sent an email saying like, my son is very interested in what you're doing. Um, and so by no means was my dad like close with this guy, but the mere fact that my dad like reached out and they had some sort of interaction, um, and I suppose they were probably on good terms, um, <laughs> allowed me to get a position in his lab. And so that was one of the luckiest things that happened to me. Um, and so I wrote here that it's the best chance to get a research position. Um, but sometimes it may be difficult to have these connections because they may not exist. Um, but um, from talking to other people, um, a lot of people have pursued this avenue. Um, so I have experience with that if you want to ask me questions. Yeah. So when you're going to the lab, did you, uh, how do your guide you? So are you, are you watching them? Or? 
you know, sounds like you know the French, you know those French, uh, you know those relationship. They when they uh, reintroduce you there, they don't have a structure for yeah. them for you. So yeah. how do you approach them, and how does this happen? Yeah. So <coughs> I am about to get into that in my okay. next slide. So uh -huh. I'm just going to go. On. Um, so there are different advantages and disadvantages of these two avenues, I suppose. Now, a summer program is, as you said, it's more structured. Uh, you have guaranteed attention, you know. Um, they even have schedules set up for you to meet with, like, professors and discuss your project to make sure that you're on track. Um, the second point is that it's a guaranteed project because they're going to make sure that you succeed, whether or not you actually do the work, to be honest. Um, and so you have a guaranteed project. The third part is that it's more guided learning. Uh, this ties in with the fact that you have instruction, you know. Um, they're, they're going to teach you everything you need to know, um, and they're kind of going to spoon feed you a little bit. And the last part is that it looks good on college apps, um, because you've already reached a certain standard of excellence that you were admitted to this program, and so colleges can see that, um, and they'll know that, okay, this guy has met a certain standard, um, and that's good. So the advantages of um, independent research, so this is what I have. I have like much more experience with is that it's much more hands-on you know you're kind of thrown in the water you don't really know a whole lot um, the main things that they're going to teach you are safety procedures um, making sure that they won't be liable for uh, if you die um, they're not going to teach you so much about oh how are you going to start uh, using this scanning scanning tunneling microscope how are you going to go about um, measuring the conductance value of a single molecule and so these are things that either you pester them until they teach you, or you read and read and read and hope that somewhere it'll tell you how to do it. Um, I was kind of lucky in that uh, the postdoc that was working with me, um, he made sure to teach me um, everything that I needed to know. Um, well, not everything, but the fundamentals to conduct my experiment. But I had to do a lot of the, the thinking and analysis of my results on my own. Um, so. The second advantage is that there's a lot more flexibility. So whereas in a summer program, you may only get like six hours in a lab per day. Um, when I was working at Stanford last year, uh, I was spending like 10 hours <laughs> in the lab um, because I, I needed that um, to make sure that I was getting results. And so um, there's, there's a big advantage there. If, if you're really passionate about this, um, you, you get the advantage that you can do a lot more. Um, and the last part, development of independence and problem solving should be pretty, pretty self-explanatory. And obviously there's no cost. Um, and at some times they may even pay you. So yeah. So how often do you use that doctor? Yeah, so my dad contacted the professor of the department mm -hmm. and I met with him I think twice over the summer. And um, the postdoc I met with um, informally, mm -hmm. like every day, I would say like hi and stuff. Um, but to meet and actually talk was maybe at most once a week, um, and probably less than that. So I'm going to try to go a little bit faster since we don't have that much time. Um, what my activities demonstrated, you know, there was a passion. I talked about that. There's leadership. It should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, science poll, um, obviously I met a certain standard to be the number one at Limbrook. Um, dedication, because I was involved in it for five years. Um, my research internship uh, shows independence because uh, I pretty much designed my own project and conducted it. Um, what? Yeah, so Stanford was the summer before my 12th grade year, and uh, I actually did another project at Arizona State um, the summer before my 11th grade year. So yeah. Um, so it also showed commitment because I was, instead of playing video games over summer, I was doing something. Um, and also capability because I encountered many problems, some of which I may have talked about in a few college essays I actually did talk about, um, and how I overcame them. And so it kind of, these show certain qualities um, about me. So there's also the more, um, I kind of talked about this, I believe this is really important. Um, this one kind of showed that not only am I good at science, 
um, but I also have compassion, you know. I want to spread this passion to other people. Um, I have a drive because I went out and I did something with no prompting me to do it. And maturity because I do meet a certain level of professionalism, I guess, um, to talk with these adults and to interact with these people who I had never really interacted with before. And most of my peers will never interact with in their lives. Um, so yeah, it showed a few things about me. And obviously covering my bases, well-rounding this, and uh, a wholesome person, I guess. <coughs> so, conquered part two. Uh, here's part three college apps. Uh, the first part I'm gonna talk about is getting a counselor. Uh, this is something that I think is pretty much a necessity uh, nowadays, is getting a counselor just to make sure that you're always on track and getting another opinion on your essays. So I started searching for a counselor in April of my junior year. Um, so um, this is a lot earlier than most people, to be honest. Um, then I started meeting immediately. And these were like bi-weekly meetings, like maybe once every two weeks. But I kind of ramped it up as it got closer to submission season, I suppose. So these are just some of the things that my counselor helped me with. Um, probably most counselors are going to help you with the same things, so um, yeah. And I eventually ended my meetings in mid-December. And I kind of included this slide just to show like how long I was involved with this process. Um, and keep in mind that this is longer than most people. <coughs> how do you define who to cut someone? Yeah, so my experiences with my counselor, I would say were less than ideal. Um, mainly because like the feedback she gave me on my on my uh, essays was stuff that I personally didn't agree with and not only that but it was sometimes just blatantly uh, I believe to be um, uh, bad I, I guess um, so uh, but I would I would say that a counselor that um, takes the time to really read your essays to give uh, real feedback um, and to actually check in with you once in a while um, is these are all good qualities of counseling. Yeah. So here's just a list of the schools that I applied to. It's not too important. And um, I applied to these three schools early. And I hope you guys know what that is, because I don't really want to talk about it. <coughs> so essay writing. Um, I'm going to say that, in my opinion, these are the most crucial part of your college apps. Um, and this is because um, I know people who have won international competitions who get rejected from colleges. But I also know people who have not done anything uh, that has surpassed maybe a regional level in terms of winning things, but they've written a good essay and they've gotten in places. And so in, in my personal opinion, I think essays are extremely important for colleges. Um, and so on that note, I think it's extremely important to start writing early. Um, so I started writing maybe in June. Um, before like submitting in December. So yeah. Um, experiences with writing narratives really helps because most of your uh, essays are going to be narratives. They're going to be like stories. Um, and so I personally didn't have a whole lot of experience writing narratives. So my first essays were pretty bad. Um, and my second essays were pretty bad too. So um, looking at successful examples can really be helpful. So. Um, my counselor, that was, honestly, that was the biggest part she helped me with, because she couldn't help me, but her previous students could help me. So looking at the examples really helped because I could see, like, this is how you tell a story. This is how you engage uh, the admissions officer um, and show qualities without specifically st stating them. And one of the more important uh, sentences uh, that you should repeat to yourself while you're writing an essay is, show don't tell um, and so that's something that looking at examples can help you learn how to do um, so yeah I started writing pretty early um, and I can honestly say that the later essays were infinitely easier to write um, and some of you may think that I'm lying when I say this but uh, I did my entire Yale application on the last day um, because I initially did not want to go to Yale um, and I decided at the last minute that I would apply. Um, so, 
And by that time, I had a ton of experience writing essays. And so it was very easy to, for me to just um, write these, these lines. Um, and I could also reuse a few things that I wrote before. <coughs> so yeah. And the last part, I talked about this when I was talking about extracurricular activities, um, is that um, summer experiences, or just like experiences in general, really help because they give you stories to tell. Um, they give you, hopefully, interesting stories uh, in which you learned something or grew in some aspect. And so that's an important part. <coughs> so here are my admissions results. Um, hopefully, um, they don't look too bad. Um, so you can see I was rejected by MIT and Caltech. MIT was actually the school that I really wanted to go to. Um, I was initially deferred by them uh, and then rejected in the regular admissions process. Um, so here I wrote Yale that I was a likely admit, which means that um, usually you get your admissions decision um, on the last week of April, uh, whereas I got my admissions decision on the last week of January. Um, so I had more time to think about if I wanted to go. Um, I was waitlisted, those are the yellow ones. And I'll talk about why I think I got waitlisted. And hopefully I don't sound too bitter when I say it. Um, <laughs> and these last few are just like some other schools that I, admit, I was admitted to. Um, so yeah. So after like kind of reflecting on how the admissions process went, um, I noticed what I think is pretty interesting. Um, I submitted the same essay to these schools uh, and no other schools, and I was admitted to all of them. Um, and at the same time, I submitted the same essay to these three schools, um, which some may think it are not as hard to get into as, say, Yale or Berkeley. Um, and so I think there was an interesting relationship there. And it really um, emphasizes the importance of writing good essays. Um, because you can s clearly see here, and I don't want to make like a conclusion, but um, it's just something that I noticed that I thought was very interesting that the same essay was successful in all these places and a different essay was unsuccessful in all these places. So um, that kind of adds to what I was talking about earlier, that essays are very, very important. <clears throat> So what's the difference between these two essays? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I should probably have uh, put something up that up here. Um, so one of the most obvious differences is that uh, this essay was like a 500 to 600 word essay, while this essay uh, was like a 250 word essay. So it may just be that I am a better storyteller when the conversation is longer, right? Um, that may be true now because I've been running over time. Um, but um, at the same time, there could be other factors as well. So, and I really don't want to go too much in detail here because um, I, I this is all speculation. So I don't really want to give like some false advice. So both essay you all talk about your personal experience. Yeah, I actually talk about the same thing. Um, it was just that I, I wrote a different essay um, for the shorter version, and it was unsuccessful. And another thing, the, the yellow ones you submitted early, that is a later essay? There's a time details, but maybe later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be better than so um, these were all submitted at the same time, and this one was submitted uh, earlier than Yale and Carnegie Mellon, um, but with very little revision. Um, but yeah, this was written, I guess, a little bit earlier. And these were based off this one, but were quite significantly changed due to the length constraint. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess, interesting to look at as well. But in the end, this is all speculation. Yeah. Any further? So, yeah. so a typical essay is something like six to 700 words? Um, it varies a lot. Um, sure, so, than I thought. Uh, yeah. So. It depends on school, like, for example, University of Chicago, they have a limit of like 650 words. However, my essay was like 900 words, uh, but they didn't care. Um, and so that's like a, one example maybe. 
Um, and other, other schools may want you to submit multiple essays, right? So the UCs want you to submit two essays, and you have a thousand words um, to split however you like uh, to tell both of those stories. Um, I know like USC, which I didn't apply to, has like a billion essays that you need to write. So it varies a lot from school to school. Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. Actually, this is, this is a question that uh, I think many of the Chinese community are aware of. Yeah. That is, especially in Ivy League mm -hmm. school, they are discriminating actually against Asian, uh, particular I mean, Asian, especially boys. Mm -hmm. And there's, a, uh, there's some aspects how, how much we have handicapped, we have to overcome in terms of school and so on. Yeah. And they said that usually they, the, the, the evaluator will look at essay and can tell not only by your name, but uh, the essay you write. That you're an Asian First of all, are those discrimination uh, real from your point of view? Yeah, so. Well, what, uh, anything we can do about it. Yeah, um, so I kind of mentioned this earlier. I was at a panel yesterday, um, and it was kind of, it was like an education day where parents could ask questions. And so one of the questions that came up was basically that question. And so what I thought and what uh, several of my peers thought as well was that if you're aiming high, um, there's really no reason that you should be thinking about that um, because um, it really shouldn't matter. Like you should be significantly better than the rest of the pack uh, if you're aiming this high. Um, so I really like, there is like a statistical um, disadvantage, right? There is a disadvantage that's vis visible on paper, but when you're going through this app process, um, in no way was I feeling like I was like being held back in some way. And no, like, I didn't get into Harvard, right? I didn't get into Stanford. Um, and I'm not focused on saying like, it's because I'm an Asian male. Right. I think that there are certain things that I'm lacking in, um, specifically in my essays and um, in other areas as well that I can reflect on. Um, so honestly, I don't think it plays as big of a role um, as, I, as some people may think it does. Um, perhaps it does play a role, but um, honestly, I don't, I don't think that um, it should be considered uh, when you're applying because it's simply not good for your mentality. Um, and sorry, I kind of forgot <laughs> your second question. Uh, the se well, it doesn't matter. If you don't think it's an important factor, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, my second question is, if it is a fact, then you know, How do you deal with it? we can avoid it. Uh, yeah. We can um, uh, try to protect ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's to do. I think the best thing that you can do is just to ignore it um, and do the best that you can because there, there's really nothing that you can do. Um, if there is this disadvantage that exists, um, really the best thing you can do is do as well as you possibly can. Right. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about your essay writing experience. Yeah. Uh, you said the first writing takes several months. Yeah. So during this process, you keep going back to uh, thinking about it and writing it. Or you have an editor or uh, get consultation yeah. keep money. How, how do you work for such a long time? Yeah, so I'll be completely honest and say that my first few months, I wasn't really thinking about my essays. Um, because I started in June, but that was around the time when I was starting my research. And so juggling essay writing with like 50 hour work weeks is, is pretty difficult. And so um, I. I'm not, I can't really say for certain that, um, that there was some certain like thing that I did that was like worse at that point. I was seeing my counselor uh, throughout this entire period, um, but I just wasn't making as much progress, I guess. Yeah. And I didn't have very much experience either. Oh, okay. We don't have a lot of time left, so I'll try to get through this. Um, I talked about this earlier. Seeking counseling is really important. Um, second point, I didn't really talk about this, but the benefits of applying early to a school are, are far better than the downsides um, because um, they
they, it, it essentially forces you to finish your essay writing earlier, um, which will help you later, whether you believe it or not. Um, and the feeling of getting into a school in December um, takes an uh, extreme amount of stress off of you um, off for your second semester. So me getting into the University of Chicago on December, um, that was seriously like the biggest relief um, because I had just gotten deferred by Caltech and MIT, so I was extremely stressed. Um, and so getting that news uh, in December was, it was, it made everything worth it uh, for applying early because, so that's kind of why I tell people, uh, underclassmen, that you should definitely apply early uh, if there's a school that you know you're interested in. <clears throat> and so, uh, again, starting early on essay writing, not only essay writing, but just pretty much everything, starting early will help you a lot. Uh, learning experiences work the best for essays. Uh, I think I've beat this in enough. Um, and the last part is something that counselors will tell you, uh, is don't limit yourself to the prompt. Because when a prompt asks you um, what is the most de defining experience, or what was like the most significant experience uh, within the last year, they don't care what the experience was. They care about what did you learn from it, right? So don't limit yourself to the literal meaning of the prompt, because in the end, all they want to do is learn about you, um, and they don't really care about what exactly, like, oh, what was the weather, or like, whatever. I don't know what people write about, but try to tell a story that tells something about you. So uh, whether that means following the prompt or going beyond it um, depends. Oh yeah, that was just like the last point I added. Um, trying to apply to Yale at the last minute was the best decision of my life. <clears throat> so, last section, we have 15 minutes left. I'm um, gonna talk about family support. So, um, troubles in high school. This is the only trouble that I listed on here because it's by far the greatest trouble that I encountered in high school, it's motivation. Um, because when you are taking on so many things, and when you don't succeed in all of them, it's very difficult to keep yourself going, um, even if you are extremely uh, passionate about something. Um, and so there are several things that I want to talk about, which first being school. Um, something that happened to me was I began to get distracted frequently, you know, browsing the web instead of doing homework. Um, second point is that I worked less efficiently. Um, I started sleeping later. Uh, that was the main result of this, because I was spending unnecessary time doing things. Um, I looked at schoolwork as a chore. To be honest, I looked at schoolwork as a chore most of the time anyways. Um, but specifically, it became an unbearable burden. Um, and so there were times that I may have skimmed on my homework, and uh, it's something that I deeply regret. Um, and lastly, I just became really stressed. Um, it's honestly, there's, there's nothing worse than, um, than thinking that a lot of your effort is just gonna be wasted. And so, um, keeping motivated is extremely important. Um, and it gave me a lot of stress when I started losing it. Um, there's extracurriculars uh, and testing. So, as I said, like, there were some things that, like, I didn't always, like, win things. And I didn't always succeed, even when I put in a lot of effort. Um, and so these failures um, really made me um, uh, start to lose my motivation. Um, but eventually they became a bigger motivating factor, which was good. Um, and so I started kind of wanting to stop um, just because I thought like maybe, oh, if I, if I keep failing, what will this all be for, right? Uh, I could just go to some other school. Um, but very good that my family kept me on track um, so that I stayed motivated. The last part is like, okay, I started thinking, okay, I'll never get in that place anyways. Why am I trying so hard? But this is definitely the wrong mentality to have um, because everyone has a great chance of getting where they want to be um, if they put in the effort. And that's, that's just something that I, I, it's a terrible thought to have. Um, and yeah, made me lose motivation for other things as well. So how my family helped me, um, 
all I can really say is encouragement. There's obviously other things like taking care of like life, I guess. Um, but the encouragement in particular helped me with my motivation problems. Uh, they kept me focused on my goals, so um, I wasn't losing sight of like where I wanted to be in the next few years, what I wanted to achieve uh, in the current day. And so um, I tr they encouraged me to learn as much as I could, so not skimping out on schoolwork, you know. Looking at school as an opportunity to learn, um, and maybe it's not um, specifically helping me achieve what I want, but the, the learning that you get at school is, is honestly, it's invaluable. Uh, and thinking that it's a waste is really foolish. Um, and doing my best in both academics and beyond, they just constantly um, gave me support to make sure that I was doing the best that I could. Um, maybe not necessarily always winning things, but um, if you give your best effort, you always learn things. Um, and so next time, you might do better. <clears throat> and so the last part is getting into my dream schools. Um, this is actually something they told me before I even knew what dream schools I wanted to go to, um, but yeah, like keeping reminding me um, of what I was shooting for, you know, the constant reminders, those are really helpful. <clears throat> of course, sometimes they can be annoying, but uh, they're still helpful. So the next part is that they talk with me, you know. I think a lot, I was really surprised um, when I learned that, because like I've been talking to some of my friends just about this stuff. And I was really surprised that a lot of kids don't really talk with their parents. Like they don't like eat together ever, or they don't really talk. And this is something that I think I'm really lucky because I have a pretty good relationship with my parents, I would say. Um, so it, it gave me like a good way to communicate and, and blow off steam and like discuss what was on my mind and express what my thoughts were. Um, so that was really good. And the last point is that they didn't force me to do anything. Um, so this was something that was really touched upon a lot at the panel yesterday. And so the other people on the panel were always all, were all other students who got into great schools. And something we all touched upon um, was that our parents didn't ever force us to do anything. Um, so we were always the driving force behind what we wanted to do. But whatever we wanted to do, uh, they would support us. So I think that's extremely important. So it's not like I was told to do science. Um, they saw that I was interested in science even before I knew it, um, and they guided me towards it. So everything was my choice. And the last part is that they gave me responsibility for myself, but they still provided support. So um, another thing I touched upon yesterday was that it's essential to find a sort of trust <clears throat> between the parent and the child. Um, so that like it's it's important not only for like getting into college, doing well in high school, but it's so so important for like beyond. So like micromanaging your kid is not going to do any good. Um, having a sort of trust to know that they will be um, doing the things that they need to do is it, it like the kid can see it and they'll really appreciate it. Um, and I think it it really helps with gaining independence for later on in life. Um, so, what my family did specifically in the college apps process is a lot of discussion. Um, I talked with my family. I said at least once a week, but that was not really true in the beginning, but more true uh, as it came closer to the, to the deadline. Um, but they always kept track of what I was doing and made sure that I was making progress. Um, and also they gave me input on my college list, like where I would be applying to. It wasn't like they told me, okay, you got to apply Harvard, you got to apply Stanford. Um, it was like, I was choosing these schools and they were giving their input. So um, that was good. Um, kept me thinking realistically. Um, so yeah, my decisions to apply somewhere were more like, um, I was just like, okay, I'll just apply for fun. Um, so did you so yeah. spend a lot of time check the school you are going to apply? Yeah, so the what my family did was um, how my school does it is if you want to apply somewhere, 
um, you need to order a transcript and have a transcript sent uh, as early as like November maybe. So what my family did was we decided to send like a bunch of transcripts everywhere because they only cost $3 each, right? And you will have the opportunity to either apply there or, or just not submit anything and you only lose $3. So we submitted transcripts to like a billion places uh, like, like Brown and whatever, but I didn't end up applying there. And so this was crucial for me um, because they submitted one to Yale and I didn't submit my essay. I didn't start my essay until the last day. And so that was, I don't know, I guess it like was life changing. Um, but yeah, like that's kind of how it worked. What makes you the, uh, change your mind to apply you? Um, to be honest, it wasn't so much like I wanted to go. It was like I had some time. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll just apply. Um, because like I finished, I forget which school was due on uh, January 1st, but I like finished that one and yet was due on December 31st. So I just did it. Yeah. Um, Why Yale was not in your list? Um, so a big reason is that my brother goes there. Um, so uh, yeah, I didn't really want to go there. Um, but another reason was that like after my brother was admitted, I visited the campus and I just didn't really like it that much um, because I came into it with the um, outdated idea that the area surrounding Yale is is um, uh, what some would call sketchy, like kind of like Oakland maybe, I don't know. Um, it's, it's not the safest place to be, uh, or at least in previously it wasn't, so I had this idea that I would be like in constant fear of getting shot. Um, <laughs> but in reality, it's just completely untrue. And so my two more recent visits to Yale really changed uh, my view on that. So, yeah. um, and so for essay help, um, we went through my essays together. You know, I got feedback. It's always helpful to get another opinion, no matter whose it may be. Um, and so they helped me refine my ideas, find my writing voice, because they could tell when I was like, um, making stuff up, or they could tell when I was like trying to be someone that I wasn't. And when you're applying to colleges, it's very important that you don't try to sound like someone else. Um, because I, I honestly, I think people can tell when you're like making something up. Um, they made sure that I was showing my best side. Um, so if I was exposing some immaturity um, unknowingly, they would know and they would show me and point it out. Something that my counselor didn't help me a whole lot with but I think that was just my counsel to be bad. Um, just a few more things. Um, getting through college rejections and deferrals. Um, these were pretty bad, but um, my parents helped me get through it. Um, there's just a bunch of these encouragement things that I kind of talked about earlier. Um, but some uh, particular point I want to draw attention to is that they looked through my application, uh, some of my old ones, um, just to see like, okay, is there anything that you can do better? Um, because some of my early apps came came back, like I got deferrals um, in early December and some of my apps weren't due until late December, right? Um, and so they, they looked through my app with me and they tried to see, okay, where can I improve here? Where can I improve here? And then we'll submit these new and improved essays to other students. And so that was really helpful. Now, the last way that they helped me with the eventual decision was just talking with me, you know, like seeing what I thought. Um, and big, big important point is that they didn't force anything on me. Um, I know my mom kind of wanted me to stay close by, so Berkeley was good, but uh, <laughs> sorry, mom. Um, and yeah, they, they supported my eventual decision, you know. So that, that was, that's really good. It's a good feeling to have that like your parents are happy where you're going. So yeah, um, just a few last slides. Honestly, this title sounds more important than it really is. And I've kind of been talking about these, these few points throughout this entire presentation. But these are just a few things that I think were especially important uh, that I did. So not only did I step outside my comfort zone, not only did I create my own opportunities for success, but the last point I didn't really talk about was that I looked for help when I needed it. 
You know, there's no way you're going to get through college, um, I mean high school, uh, or the college app experience alone. So understanding when you need help is really important. Um, and this includes getting help at school. Um, teachers are honestly more willing to help you than you may sometimes realize. Um, so doing that is it really, really helping. And I suppose my title was not the best for this slide. Oh, okay, right on the nine o'clock dot, here are some final thoughts. Um, honestly, most of these sound really cliche, but I think they're really, really true. Um, there are no shortcuts, you know. There's no way that you're going to get into some school by a stroke of complete luck. You know, luck is a big factor, but um, nothing you do uh, for the sake of doing it, like, randomly, um, is, is really going to get you anywhere. Um, so there are no shortcuts, you know. Do things honestly and do things uh, to the best of your ability. Now the next thing is time is of the essence. I talked about this like through my entire presentation. Start early, um, it's, it's extremely helpful. Uh, third one is understanding yourself is key. Um, making sure that you know how you study best, making sure you know how you appear to other people um, really factors into your time management. It factors into how your relationships work with your teachers and getting teacher, teacher recommendations. Uh, and it factors into a whole bunch of things that can help you on later. Um, you have to really want something to get it. Um, this ties into there are no shortcuts, you know. You have to always give your best. Um, this part, colleges look for interesting and intelligent people. Um, that's kind of why I tell you to round your bases, because uh, cover your bases, because you need to look well-rounded. You need to be a person. Uh, you need to have a story to tell that people will actually want to read uh, when you apply to colleges, so that's really important. Last one, luck is a huge factor. I, there's no way that I can say that I got into these colleges um, purely based on my achievement. Um, yeah, like, I was lucky, and some people weren't, so, yeah. Do you mind to tell who you write your theology? Yeah, so, um, I guess I'll tell you, like, the, the which subjects they taught me. So I got a letter of recommendation from my AP chemistry teacher and from my AP language and composition teacher. Um, and so the reason I chose these teachers was because they were actually teachers that I sought help from uh, outside of class. So they, I guess they had more interaction with me. Not only that, but I had also uh, achieved like, s like good things in their class, right? For example, my AP language and composition teacher uh, has kept my research paper as an example for future years. Um, and my chemistry teacher, um, I had like a 95 in his class, but an A in his class is considered as 85%, so I was like, pretty good in that class. Um, so yeah, um, that's what I did. And